Digital Learning Design Unit based in Dublin City University. And our presentation today will explore the role of technology in shaping academics' uh, pedagogical beliefs and outline our approach to supporting academics in developing their online teaching and learning design competencies uh, during this ongoing pandemic. And um, in recent years, uh, we as educators have become accustomed to our role as agents of change. We work hard to stay relevant and to uphold the quality of the education that we offer while simultaneously responding to societal and economic change uh, by introducing new methods and practices into our teaching. And truthfully, it is a very slow process and one that faces many challenges, um, including our own ingrained uh, desire to hold on to the processes that we know and are most familiar with. And without doubt, teachers have greatly contributed to the adoption and dissemination of technology in education. Um, our personal and professional use of technology has massively increased in recent years. And we have readily accepted um, so many tools, uh, so many convenient tools, such as online databases and digital presentations and e-portfolios, computer-based quizzes and exams. And um, blended learning has become part of our everyday reality. And as we were preparing to take these processes a step further and incorporate more technology into our teaching, the pandemic happened. And um, it forced a worldwide transition to uh, classroom, um, from classroom, from traditional classroom learning to online in a matter of weeks. Um, turning wobbly steps into leaps. Uh, technology made this transition possible, uh, but in turn it has greatly challenged our existing pedagogical beliefs. And teachers, as a matter of habit, naturally gravitate towards um, the practices most similar to what they are familiar with. And traditional face-to-face -face learning has been replaced um, with synchronous sessions online hosted via Zoom or similar video and audio conferencing platforms. And in doing so, we have neglected the inherent differences between online and traditional classroom learning. Teachers, I believe, are subject to and uh, subjects of change. And to quote Van der Heiden et al, the rapidly changing society of today requires from teachers that they are able and willing to cope with the many challenges of change. And under normal circumstances, teachers would require time and many opportunities to reflect on their beliefs and to adjust their practices accordingly. But the pandemic has taken time out of the equation and forced teachers to commit to these changes, regardless of personal experiences and expertise, leaving many of us feeling mired in a quicksand of technological innovation. And if we assume that change is necessary, what can we do to facilitate it? How can we support uh, academics? How can we lessen the burden placed on teachers and help them develop towards a mode of online learning that is not merely replacing classroom learning. And now I would like to tell you a little bit about our experience at Global City University. Since February, uh, DCU has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic in many different ways. Um, the university quickly adapted and um, to the challenges of this crisis and move its teaching online uh, in a matter of, of days. 
uh, building on its experience and expertise and reputation for um, online and blended learning, DCU made a commitment to continue to deliver um, a high quality of education while preserving as many services and options for our students as possible. And we sent out surveys to both students and staff um, prior to the beginning of this academic year. And over 40% students, um, prospective first year students, were concerned about adapting to their new online learning environment. Uh, while three out of 10 were worried about making friends um, when they start college in September. And similarly, staff expressed uh, concerns over online delivery of modules and programs. And the results of these surveys were then um, informed, they, they then informed DCU's hybrid learning policies and prompted the creation of the Digital Learning Design Unit. At the heart of our approach um, is the creation of a positive learning environment for our students. Conscious of the challenges students and staff are facing during the pandemic, uh, DCU developed a new set of hybrid learning principles. Loop, uh, which is DCU's learning management system, uh, became a one-stop shop for assignments, content, and all student and staff activity. And then the creation, um, the creation of new modules and program pages Priority was given to clear design, uh, clear and consistent design and communication, self-directed engagement, accessibility, and collaboration and community. DCU has successfully implemented these principles during the first semester of this, this academic year, not without challenges, um, but we made a commitment to continue and improve this approach when we come into semester two. And um, now I will hand over to my colleague, Orna, and she will tell you a bit more about our digital learning design unit. Thanks, Alex. Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, delighted to be here. Some interesting discussion going on in the chat there about hybrid and blended and all the terminology. High flex, I see a lot on Twitter as well. Uh, some of this, it'd be great to get a little glossary of all the COVID terminology that's emerged. So the story I suppose we're gonna tell you is one piece in the puzzle. And just to draw on some of the earlier speakers' observations as well about um, the experiences working with staff and some of the focus on tools. And one way I suppose we've tried to put structure on that is to, to put a kind of a learning design lens on how we do things. So our, our unit was created because of the pandemic. Um, so it's a learning design unit with 10 staff and we've been working with staff since August, end of August, and essentially focusing on those hybrid learning principles. So supporting staff, giving them professional development, also helping them with the learning design of their modules and courses. Um, initially, we took a kind of sprint approach, borrowing from the kind of business style. So we did these kind of intensive two day sprints with program teams. So we were trying to get a bit of scale. Um, so we would be working with maybe eight or 10 academics for two days. And we centered our, our sessions around the ABC approach to learning design. So we did the, the professional development and simultaneously, some of our team would uh, enhance uh, loop, loop courses. So loop is our Moodle instance uh, for people. Um, so just to give you a flavor what that those sessions looked like. So, so we framed it around the ABC learning design approach. So the first session would be and essentially a kind of a mini ABC um, learning design session. 
and we'd be trying very much to get the, the the program team to agree some common kind of learning design approaches across modules um now so that was easier sometimes than not and <laughs> um, you know we came across kind of resistance and tool focus and some of the things that the earlier group uh were talking about um, and we learned a lot initially i think we were too tool focused too so we, we we you know after doing about 10 of these uh we, we've been constantly iterating what we do so we're on about version four or five now but particularly i remember the first few pilot ones we did too much tools too much content so we paired it back you know we tried to personalize what are you interested in learning about but also we we tried we started mapping it to the learning design framework so when we were talking about self-directed practice activities we'd look at the definitions from abc we'd look at the suggestions for activities and then we would look at the tools so we would try and go to the tools later i see in the chat there yeah it's a lot it's a lot of cash all right deborah that's it yeah no pressure i oh, know um but you're right we, we are kind of unique have the university finding the cash to do that um but i suppose the need was felt very strongly that's that staff needed support they want also the the need to create a good student experience was was felt very strongly too we the, there was a feeling that students were quite forgiving in march april may and they would be less forgiving in september so that was kind of a driver as well. So you can see there, that's the two day design sprint, very intensive, very effective, but a bit overwhelming. So the kind of feedback from staff, we did that those for about a month, was we need more time and space to think about what you're telling us. We need time and space to try out these new tools, yeah? So we started uh, disaggregating those a bit and, and changing up how we were offering support. Ours is a completely demand-led support. So people come to us, we don't come to them. So how big were the groups? Typically, uh, the biggest I think we did had about 14 or 15 academics. And the way we also did it was we, we were focused on small group facilitation. So for example, if we want to show a team how to uh, create discussion forum type activities, we would break them into small groups of three or four. Uh, we would demonstrate the, uh, how to do it, and then we would get them to make one themselves on screen. Um, so very hands-on, and that's dead. I think one of, one of the reasons is actually my philosophy, because I think it's pointless telling someone how to, to click the buttons on Zoom. You know, they need to do it themselves. So I, uh, my, my philosophy was always about getting, giving people the space to try things, even if it was for two minutes. Um, so there's a little bit about ABC, just to tell you the kind of background framework. So we evolved from that uh, two day sprint and this is our current support offerings. We broadened it out a lot, based mainly on feedback from staff. Uh, also just our, our own experience, having worked with a lot of staff in a very, very, uh, so Uve, it was a mix of scale, but it was also quite targeted. So the faculty, faculties kind of decided who they'd like us to work with. And a lot of the faculties decided they wanted to focus on first years, for example. So we might have worked with a whole team from different programs across the first year. Or some said, OK, we need to do some. I, I do like a cog, Martin. And um, so some said, you know, we need our master's program is going to be fully online. So it was very much up to the the faculties themselves to direct where they would like us to go, essentially. And then we would try and tailor our uh, our approach to that group. So, you know, one day we might have been working with people from science and the next day someone from education is very diverse. And as, as the, the longer we work, we're into month five now, the more I've learned how quite different people are and how quite different their attitudes are, their beliefs, even just the dynamics of the group, because we are working a lot with program teams you know, and, and how they function together as well. It, it, very interesting. So you can see there we've broadened it out. What we're doing a lot of now is a mixture of one-to-one -one kind of consultation sessions, module redesign. So that's completely redesigning a module, possibly taking a month, six weeks to do that with a with team. 
and we're just starting to get into new program design and development. Some, some teams are actually looking at next September, so September 21. And still, our, our, one of our most popular things is rapid enhancement of, pro, of modules. So that's like we do 20 things to improve the user experience and, and design of a module. Very simple things, but we make a module look tidy, clean, very nice uh, learning journey through it for students. Uh, people love it, though. Um, so that's kind of the, what we've done by numbers. So you can see scale was a thing. So that's to November. Uh, you could add 40 to each of the, those numbers now for December. So total number of modules, about 164. About 176. So that was the end of November. As I said, December has been really busy because we've been focusing on semester two. And, I, I, and just from my head, I can, I can tell we've done about 40 more of each of those. And you can see there what was been popular. You can see also different faculties. Like we are very popular in the business school and in the faculty of education, but less popular in, in engineering and computing. And part of that is actually because even going back to the staff survey that was done uh, is that that faculty actually came out as feeling the most comfortable. So that, you know, it makes perfect sense, but also one big challenge we've come across is people don't actually have the time to engage in, 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 in with us or in, in even in a little bit of professional development. They're very, they were very overwhelmed. They're less overwhelmed now. In, uh, internal or external, what kind of data are you talking about, Ruth, there? How they design new modules. So for the new modules, yes, we have a, a process where you have to consult with industry, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so, so that's a kind of a university system already in place. So a bit of feedback now. I mean, even in this short space, it's been five months. Um, we have learned a huge amount. Absolutely, Ruth. So yeah, as that would be part of our kind of standard uh, new module design process would be a kind of a, an, an analysis of the market, speak to industry partners, professional bodies, previous students, graduate, uh, so graduates, student survey data, quite broad. So there's a bit of staff feedback. There's a tweet because I love the I love the Twitter. Tweet me some if you feel like at or underscore Farrell. Um, so Emma, yeah, we do essentially have a kind of a template and actually that's where we're going to try and scale it up even more. Um, Yes, so we're going to make two or three different templates that we can use as starter templates, but essentially we do use a bit of templating. But then we will customize as people want. You know, if people have a particular design structure that they like, you know, they might have some pre reading material, they might, you know, then have a synchronous session, and then they might like some practice activities. Training interventions optional, yes, Sonia. Although um, early on, I think there might have been a big step, but it wasn't mine. Um, but yeah, they very much are optional. Yeah. Um, then you can see a couple of quotes from people as well. Very practical, hands on. That makes me very happy because that's been central. Time and space, I think, is so important. And that's one thing I've learned is if you sow the seed early on. So, for example, you might say something like maybe you could do a little bit of asynchronous work there. You know, there's a lot of synchronous work. And maybe three months ago, someone might have heard that. Oh, I haven't got time to think about that. But they've come back to us months later and said, I've been thinking a bit about what you said there. You know, maybe I'll try that in semester two. So, you know, try and sow the seeds, nudge. But some people's beliefs are very difficult to change, especially if you've very transmission oriented pedagogy. And, and, and some people definitely do. Um, and perhaps um, perhaps the argument could be made, do they should they change at all? That's just maybe a bit controversial. Listen, it's been lovely talking to you. I'd love some questions. There is our emails and my Twitter handle. So I think we talked drip feeding. I think Sam, yeah, at the, sl at the long game and the slow game. And also one thing that we found as well as modeling, we have a model course, um, which kind of shows some examples. Uh, also other people have allowed us to show their pages as examples. So, you know, if you can show, oh, you know, Mary here has done a lovely job. She's in your area also, you know, have a look at this. 
Alison, that's a very long post there. <laughs> thank you so, so much, Alison. And thank you, Orna. So that I think we've got about four minutes or so. I know you've been absolutely excellent with keeping up with the questions in the chat. So I think we have covered anything. Would anyone like to take the mic and come on and ask a question at this point? You're all going to be quiet. Well, I'll fill the space and shout out to, my, to this. I think there's other team members there as well in, in the audience, Matthew as well. Uh, and one thing I suppose yeah, has been great is, uh, like we're a completely virtual team. We've never met each other uh, in, in the reels and like fantastic <laughs> team. Uh, I think some of my other colleagues had a blog post there during the week in the old blog about our kind of teamwork and approach. So listen, thanks everyone for your attention. It's been great. Brilliant. So I'll just um, ask a question then to finish this up and um, exactly on time. And you both kind of referred to the whole sense of the overwhelming and the time pressures and the stick versus the voluntary. So I was just wondering if for the next sort of wave and looking to the next semester, how you're going to get to those hard to reach areas on um, the academic side? Mm. The funny thing, Claire, is actually we. I'm not. I'm not actually trying to get people at no, all. I'm not. That's a uh, people are running towards us, and, and say even just the last month, people, you know, you can see it's registered in in their in, in staff's minds. Oh gosh, semester two is very soon. I better start thinking yeah. about it. Uh, and while we have our having to use kind of business words, having a lot of repeat customers. So people who who liked how we worked together previously. Uh, have come back again and they've told their friends so their friends are coming along as you know coming to us as well so i mean maybe that's very irish but yeah. you know no, nothing like the word spreading on the ground yeah and i think that would be um our experience as well so again maybe that's a, an, an ireland thing but word of mouth has so much more weight to it i think than any email or any kind of official notifications that we send through. So we definitely agree with that one. Mm. And I think one thing that did help was that because we're demand led, the associate deans for teaching and learning in each faculty, um, they essentially talked to the teaching and learning committee, talked to their different uh, academic colleagues and offered it. So it came through the structures of the faculties, which I think maybe is different too, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd be curious if anyone else uses a similar system. So it's not like we're putting on workshops, you know, advertising them come along. It's more that people contact yeah. us and say, you know, I need a bit of help with whatever. Well, I think I don't know if anyone's not. Faculty yeah. led certainly gives you context, I think, is the really crucial thing. And it gets you that buy in that when you're in a very mixed situation where people say that's not that's not going to do anything for me. That's not how we work. That's not what we need. So that the faculty approach definitely solves that. Mm. I see a question there from Ruth. And sorry yeah. to hug the mic. You're probably you're probably getting the next person on. Uh, do we have any KPIs to try and achieve? Uh, Ruth, early on I did set a few KPIs, but you know no one was asking me to work to KPIs. Really, all we were asked to do was try and help, you know, as many people as we could in a very short space of time. Um, and that's why we kind of went for that sprint model initially. Um, but I think we learned that actually a, a slower, you know, slower kind of slower approach probably is a bit more effective in the long run. So we've kind of, you know, we've mixed it up. Um, but yeah, KPIs, no one has asked me for them. I just gave them that infographic and they looked happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings us exactly to 20 past. So I think we've got 10 minutes before um, the next big session for the award ceremony. I have to say that I'm a bit disappointed that there was no real wine. So, you know, you can't put wine in your title <laughs> without the wine. So thanks so much for everyone and a massive round of applause for all four of our presenters. <laughs>